Unlocking Your World of Creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. Mark introduces you to some of the world's leading creative talent from publishing, film, music, restaurants, medical research, and more. You'll discover how to tap into your most original thinking, how to organize your ideas, and most of all, how to make the connections and create the opportunities to launch your creative work. Unlocking your world of creativity. Hello again, friends, and welcome back to Unlocking Your World of Creativity. Today, I'm happy to have as a guest, Senior Interactive Designer. He's at Google now, but if you used Adobe Chase Pay, if you've used Rackspace, if you used a, a lot of these interactive programs, websites, and apps, you've seen the work of my guest today, Diego Polito. Diego, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mark, for having me. It's a pleasure. You have quite a podcast here going on. I'm very, very happy to be part of it. Well, we're on a roll because of the creative people. We all like to talk to each other. And we're okay. going to imagine that we're in that Starbucks Reserve in Chelsea. And uh, <laughs> we're just having a coffee talking about creativity. Uh, we should be having an espresso martini. How about that? Like that's the one thing you can do at the Starbucks reserve that you cannot do at your regular Starbucks. So, this is this is I not mean, your corner Starbucks drive through. No, <laughs> most definitely not. Yeah, and I happen uh, to be very close to it right now. So you know, if the chance presents itself, that's that's what we're gonna do. Well, there you go. We're gonna project ourselves there. Well, Diego. So we'll we'll talk about interactive design. We'll also talk about your creative process and and your living around the world and getting these global influences. But I wanted to start with interactive design because a lot of the topics on our creative show here have to do with developing the content, you know, developing the story. But I also think that the experience or the interactivity of the content is just as important. And that's really your focus, isn't it? Yeah, it's actually called interaction design. So uh, it Even is better, but, but it's, it's in the family. Like, I, I think that I wouldn't turn around and say, no, if someone called me an interactive designer, there is a lot of what I do involves interactivity. So I am not, you know, that's, that's totally fine. But interaction design, which is the role that I play, and I've played for a number of different companies, otherwise known as user experience design, even though I do believe that interaction design, it's underneath the umbrella term of user experience design, like UX involves research, uh, involves uh, visual design, involves motion design, involves a number of other different practices. So uh, I'm just the, one of the cocks in that massive wheel of UX. And so when you get the creative brief, so to speak, when somebody comes to you and says, this is the experience that we want to design, what is your first step in really getting into and understanding the challenge? Well, yeah, I, I'm from Colombia and I'm from Bogota and uh, I've lived in France and I've lived in Italy and in the US. Uh, therefore, I speak all of those languages as well. And I find myself constantly translating what I'm saying, even right now, like in my head. Like, it doesn't matter how many years I've been in one place or the other. I'm constantly translating, thinking, and then how am I projecting it, and depending on the language that I need to project it. So uh, the way that I see creative thoughts spanning in my head are a very similar process. Whenever I hear a request of like, this screen needs to do this, or this experience needs to do this, and it needs to allow for the user to do X, Y, Z, I almost feel like I'm translating those ideas that are coming in as a line of text or as a comment into things that you can feel, you can touch, you can see, you can actually interact with. And those build, first building blocks is where the creative oven, so to speak, starts cooking and then puts those, those, some of those ideas out. Whether or not I have one idea or 10, generally speaking, is that that's almost like a translation of a different kind that I'm doing in my mind. And that's, I think, at the essence of people that are interaction designers do. And as a principle, when you say we're trying to improve the interaction, now, what is it that, you know, as we go along, we're all used to our phone, we're used to PCs, laptops, you know, we, we think interactively now, don't we? Sure. Uh, but what is the goal or what is the outcome that you're looking for when you think about developing that experience? Well, one of the most important things is to make sure that it is very clear, like for us and for the group or the company or the, like the place where I'm doing this as a designer to have the goal of the user in mind and obviously the goal of the business in mind or the, or the brand in mind. So um, we're a simple conduit between what the company wants and what the user wants and whether or not we're allowing for that goal to be completed. That's actually at the center of the user-centered process, which is something that we follow. We're always having the users in mind. We are advocate for the users because the users are not there. Therefore, we need to 
think like them, take into account how they perceive things, what kind of needs they have. And at that point, we can try and meet those needs with the goals of, in this case, the business or the company, and try to allow for the process to go from point A to point B to basically until the goal is actually met. Mm-hmm. So that's that's generally at the core of, of what we do. And I guess you're thinking about, you know, what is the end user's goal? You know, what are Absolutely. they trying to get from the experience? Exactly. But I bet in between that, we also have to have in mind, like, this is where my background in psychology may come in handy, which is like, well, in terms of perception, in terms of color, in terms of where buttons are located, in terms of what's being presented on the screen, is there a cognitive overload? Is, there, are you, is it better to put everything in one screen that you scroll versus putting it in five steps that you can follow along in, let's say, a small screen, which is what I focus on the most. It's mobile. So all of those things are part of what you need to take into account, as well as the limitations of the system, the limitations of engineering, and the limitations of time. There's all these different things that happen. And you're always trying to be that person in the room that's advocating for the user and saying, you know, like this may take more steps, but it's clear. Therefore, it will result in a better experience or it will result in completion. It will result in the user understanding, you know, wayfinding where they are, where have they been, where are they going? So for example, like a JP Morgan Chase, like when I was there, like trying to handle a Chase Pay payment and all the different steps, or for example, you know, between either Chase Pay or Quick Pay for business, like trying to understand wh- how much money I'm going to get from which account, who's the recipient, can we confirm the end, like all those different steps have to be clear for the user, especially because, you know, in this case, we're dealing with money, right? So like, that's a sensitive topic. So like trying to get that down and making sure that we design an experience on a phone that could be very interrupted because in the middle of you sending a payment from your business to another business, the bus arrived or the subway arrived, <laughs> or you got a phone call in the middle of those things, right? So it's like, like, can, when the user goes back, is it, clear to know where it is that they are, how do they exit the experience if they need to, how do we, how do they move forward? We're talking about in terms of flow of a particular experience. So the flow is very important, no matter it is what you're doing, whether you're saying yes, no to a friend request on Instagram, or you're just sending money from a business to business. At, at some point, the flow, it's always something that we have to make sure it's good for the user and clear. And it's getting, in this case, you know, the, the product to, you know, the product is on the receiving net, seeing what the user is doing and getting them to complete their goal. And you mentioned the focus on mobile. What is the yeah. state of the state now? What, what I guess, percentage of uh, interaction is done on a mobile device versus maybe a standard desktop? I mean, mobile phones are computers. That's, mm-hmm. That really is it. And I think that the more time passes, the more that we can mostly do everything on a phone. Like the technology keeps on advancing. People are getting more used to it. And one of the fascinating things for me as a, as someone who saw Steve Jobs pull out the first iPhone from his blue jeans and be like, this is, you know, this is, a, what he said, a, um, an internet uh, device, an iPod and a phone, like all these things. Like the, the moment I saw that, I, that's when I knew that my life was going to completely change because that's what I wanted to work on. So, but, but back then there were still limitations and that gap is getting closer and closer and closer. So just to kind of give you a more poignant example, if you think of the operating system inside a Mac computer and the operating system on iPhone, they've been slowly but surely getting closer together. Now you're able to do like in a way that they're almost being coded in the same way. So mm-hmm. apps that would have never worked on, a, on one device, but the other now they're starting to kind of mesh and mold. So we're, we're at a point in time in which, you, can, you know, as, as time advances and technology advances, like virtually anything can be done on a phone. And, and we've been seeing that change dramatically, like, like just ramping up very, very fast. And on top of that, the fact that, multi, that what, what multi-touch allows is at the core of it all too, because like there's nothing more fascinating than on one hand seeing my two-year-old niece playing with an iPad in the most natural of ways, because you know they expect content to be malleable. They expect content, you know, they, they expect screens to react to you. And then going from all the way to say my mom, who never, if she was put in front of a keyboard, a screen and a mouse, she wouldn't know what we're to even begin, but she's able to email, which is just another way of messaging, through her iPhone. Mm-hmm. And all of those things are just like, yep, that, that's a you know representation that we are, like technology is empowering us in a phenomenal way. And being at the center of that, it's extremely gratifying. I'm thinking about the teamwork and the collaboration. You know, you're working on the experience, the interaction part of it, but there's content, there's writers, there's graphic designers, there's animators, there's programmers. Uh, how does the team dynamic work for you? 
Uh, it's it's the only it, it's such an important part of getting things to move forward. There are cultures that are more engineering driven. There are cultures that are more design driven, more product driven. At the end of the day, we all have to be working together to be able to push things forward. And how that communication, how that interaction goes, is is at the core of it all. The way that I see it when it comes to talking specifically with it, with between product, me and engineering, is that say product managers or overall like some sort of leadership type comes up with concepts, idea, notions that then we have to start trying to turn into reality conceptually. But then it is also important for designers in, on this point in the in the process to make sure that you know we're communicating with engineering early often because the way that I like to see engineering is that they're building the dreams that I'm ideating in my head. And so so we need to make sure like as designers that we have an expectations, what can be done, what cannot be done. If, if not now, when, what is the limitations of the technology? And in a way, ideally speak a little bit of that language that they speak to be able to come up with the best ideas that suit that space. And so there's always that constant communication. And, and the way that many designers do it is by iterating different number of design ideas, shopping them around, create, having people critique them, seeing them and, and moving forward with that idea now taking into account timelines, deadlines, limitations, and so on. The bigger the company, the more you have to deal with that. The smaller the company, the more work you may have to do, but the more freedom that you have. So, but at the end of the day, at the, at the core of it all, is just without communication, collaboration, like none of those ideas would, would ever happen, especially because anybody could come up with anything, but as long as engineering is not involved, it's not going to happen. So, you know, <laughs> unless you're be, a, that's right. Yeah. Well, unless you're yeah. a designer commonly known as a unicorn is a designer and can code. Um, then yeah, unless you're a startup of one people, then yeah, you're yeah. going to have to, well, and I always you know, think about that metaphor we use. I mean, a unicorn is well, rare, if not non-existent. So, <laughs> you know, you really have to consider that teamwork. And I think about what you said about the, the customer and the psychology behind these things. And I was curious, as far as the human connection, what sort of market research, uh, observation, other kinds of ways to gain customer feedback? What, what sort of tools and methods are your channels are you using there? Sure. I mean, depend, again, depending on the company, depending on the size and the budget, there's a lot of either marketing, marketing research and there's a lot of, of like preliminary user studies about where a market is. For example, if we wanted to make the Google app more Gen Z friendly, then we would have to account for this. this, is, this is, so for example, there's a lot of research out there that said, hey, for people that are like this and are this age and are exposed to these things. These things are important. These things are not important. Those things are important to have in mind. But then there's another aspect that comes after the fact now that you have an idea about what to do and how to do it. And that is user research, user experience research. So at that point, once you have an idea and you have a concept and you need to test it out to see if it's actually resonating. In this case, again, Gen Z, just for example, we bring in a bunch of Gen Z people and like we show them this idea, hey, does using this app, like, how does it feel for you? Does it address your needs? How do you go about doing next, et cetera? Um, at that point, that's when you start getting a lot more specific data that's, that speaks to the solution that you're trying to come up with. And, and that becomes very important. But there's different stages. There's preliminary information that's very global that we can say, like, oh, like, like what's one thing that we could say about millennials? Oh, millennials, we're not looking to buy homes as much. I'm just kind of making something up, right? Mm -hmm, I just like mm -hmm. millennials don't want to buy homes because they prefer to buy avocado toast or something like that. So maybe uh, that somehow, depending on the product that we're designing, then we need to account for, say, uh, more information on lifestyle versus buying homes or something like that. Or like perhaps a particular type of users are more drawn to video versus articles and maybe surface video content like that. All those things are just very basic, very global, very out there. And then when it comes to the specific example that I'm designing, for example, a, an app for news consumption, then at that point I can say like, all right, so bring in more stuff from ABC on YouTube or something like that versus just articles or the, the aggregators that exist today because we're trying to, to tackle that demographic. And then depending on the style of the companies, depending on their design language and depending on limitations, then we come up with something that either resembles Pinterest or resembles Instagram or something new, but you know, so th th it could go really any way, but it's not done without various touch points of information for the demographic that you're trying to target. Yeah, I see what you mean. And I think that uh, as I was looking, I always love to look at the bottom of the resume, you know, the, the LinkedIn profile, the scroll way down oh, and see what, early in your the, career. The, the deep cuts, the, the B-sides. <laughs> yeah, your, that's uh, right, the B-sides. Yeah. So I was yeah. curious, you know, back in early in your career at the BA hospital or 
you know, uh, in the educational platform. You know, these were before a lot of these interaction concepts were developed. Uh, but what were the learnings that you feel like you gained as a foundation in these early experiences that you carry forward even today? That's a great question, Mark. Um, I, I think- And that's that not an interview question. I didn't get that from the <laughs> HR manual. <laughs> no, totally, no, but it's actually, no, but it, what, what's really interesting is that there's a connecting layer there that sometimes most people don't think about. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you get to, like, what did you, what, what is it what, of what you did before that has you doing what you're doing now? What hasn't, what is still inherently there? And I think that for me, it started at the end of my psychology degree in which I decided that I was interested in technology and computers. I've always thought of myself as an early adopter and I'm the first one that got Google Glass or the first Apple Watch. Or I just want to try all these things. So, uh, but then I realized that I didn't, I wasn't going to finish my psychology degree and go to a computer science degree for more years to be able to get into tech, quote unquote. So um, that's when I discovered a class called computers in psychology, which was a exper experiential and perception psychology class in which we got to use a language called visualbasic.net to program our own color and facial experiments for psychology. So I, that's when I realized that programming was not for me, but that I was still very much interested in what computers can do and technology can do. So after that, I realized that there was an, uh, I didn't know exactly what I was going to call myself a UX designer or interaction designer. I just knew that I wanted to do something to, with technology. I didn't know exactly what. And that's when I discovered the area called human computer interaction or HCI. So at that point, I realized that there was this kind of umbrella term called user experience design that held all these different, you know, interactive design, visual design, motion design. But HCI was a little bit more about cognitive science, ergonomics, human factors, a little bit more academic, just to say. Nevertheless, I think that I just started to put myself into situations that involved technology and I guess the internet. So I was a webmaster for the city of Reno, Nevada government. And I webmaster basically, I just maintained like some HTML code on a site that was pretty horrible, like just very dated. In the, at the VA hospital in Indianapolis, I uh, just took a, a very like light touch job on being a research assistant that included a lot of data entry on a computer and a lot of being exposed to just systems at the you know veterans the fair hospital like th things that would show that i had an interest in something with technology while i was getting my degree and my master's degree in human computer interaction and i was just trying to be exposed to what kind now at the time this is all pre-2007 2007 being the year where steve jobs comes out and this is like this is the iphone and then just kind of changed my life but um even at that time there was something called, you know, Windows Mobile 6 or something like that. Like uh, that already at the time, uh, the Motorola Razor, like all those phones, like I, I started to think, oh, so there's, a, there's an internet component that's mobile and it's starting to surface. And I was already interested in mobile interaction design even before smartphones as we know them today. And um, so, that's, so that's when, that's right around the time where I started to kind of shift that into, into mobile. But at the same time, like if we're talking about these deep cuts and these B-sites, I just wanted to know to what extent and in which way I wanted to be involved or exposed to technology to see how, or if at all, like how I fit in that world. Like I have an interest, but am I cut out for it? Can I do it? And if so, like what feels good? So those yeah. were just basically attempts to see to what extent. And at the point, at the time, you know, like up until mobile started to become a thing, I just thought I like, I'm going to be like a web programmer. Like I just want to do websites. Like, I guess, the web is the thing and I'm going to learn what, is it, what does it take to do that? Okay, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. All right, I guess that's kind of like what I want to do. But, I, but then again, everything quickly changed with the introduction of this smartphone. And, and here we are today talking about it on your podcast. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. Well, and thinking about, you know, the title of the podcast, The World of Creativity. Diego, you have gone from Colombia to Italy, to France, to Reno, Nevada, and now in New York and all points in between. What, yes. what is that? global exposure, you know, and cultural, you've got a very wide lens on the world. Yeah. How does that feed into your work and your creativity? Well, there is no better way to learn how multidimensional people are and how, and, and what's, what's important to different kinds of people all over the world. I mean, I, I didn't live exactly in Tokyo and like, Seoul and 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 South Africa, like I, they're they're all Western countries. Like they they have a very a lot of similarities. Yet, I also 
have traveled around the world quite extensively and um, and just for fun. And that paired with being exposed in, in long chunks of time to different cultures, different systems, different ways of seeing life, uh, it only adds to to that train of thought that when you're working on something, I guess, creative or something along those lines, like to, to try and take into account that what would work for the most people regardless of their differences. So it really just kind of makes you makes you pay attention to the fact that things have to, especially a company like Google that serves the entire world, like, like what, what works for, you know, the next billion users, right? Like, and having to take into account, I'm not going to, having lived in France and Italy doesn't make me the ultimate user experience researcher at all, but at least it, it, it's, if anything, it's a reminder that I have felt like an outsider before in different flavors and in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And, and so I can, I, I don't want to use the word pain, but I guess like I almost like feel the pain of someone who is like on the other side of that equation. And um, so I, I, it, it allows you to gain a level of understanding and empathy, which is the number one ingredient to be a designer. Like without empathy, there is no, there is no business doing mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And, 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 and because it, it, it is through empathy that you can um, come up with solutions that are more inclusive and solutions that are more, that just work for the, the most people and you know, while you take them into account. You know, you've really added a thought to this empathy and inclusion idea by turning it inside out and saying, I've known what it's like to be an outsider. You know, it's almost right. that train of thought that says, what if you were left out of the joke? Or what if you, you know, weren't involved in the conversation? You would feel like an outsider. And bringing that feeling to interaction design is an interesting idea. It, I mean, sure, because like ultimately, like, you know, even it's in the word interaction, you're allowing to, for people to interact with a system or, or you're allowing a system to, for them to interact with other people or other, you know, entities in the process of interacting with those entities. You don't want them to feel left out because you didn't understand that the right bottom placements or the right flow was adequate for X amount of people, or like it wasn't clear enough or it wasn't. So yeah, absolutely. That's when a lot of people have that you know, the reaction of the remote control, like, I don't know, there's too many bonds. I don't know what to do. Right. So, and, and having to take into account that it's, it's, you know, it's like the, that's why, I mean, perhaps the Apple TV remote is not the best example, but you know, like it's, it's something it's up there when it comes, it's, it's up there. Yeah. It, it gets closer to the, you know, the direct TV, like, you know, yeah. sorry, at and nothing against direct TV, but yes, yeah. it's just, but you know, too much, <laughs> too much. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so look into the future, Diego, I couldn't help but smile when you were mentioning the Motorola Razor. I think I had one of those. And uh, there, so are days, there are days I wish I had it back because it was a good phone back then, wasn't it? There is nothing more satisfying than ending a call by closing the Motorola Razor. <laughs> there's that, I, I don't know that there's anything more like viscerally exciting than hanging out by simply just, just clamping. <laughs> exciting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, now that, the, now that the phone is back as a foldable, people get to do that again. I'm just curious to see where companies like Apple with the iPhone are going to go into that territory or not. Yeah. But, but yeah, Motorola Racer had that unique physical aspect that hasn't been really replicated in the same way. Well, and thinking ahead then, there's no way we could know back in uh, 06, 07, 08, you know, what the world would look like today. But uh, nope. doing your best to look at the crystal ball, even thinking, you know, like you said about not just Steve Jobs, but jobs, careers, that there was no idea that some of these jobs would even exist today. But nope. what would you say to a high school student, a college student who says, I really have the technology and the interactive design bug, but where would you, where would you take it for the next 10 years? Mixed reality, hmm. augmented reality, virtual reality. There's an interesting segue between mobile and augmented reality because the phone, it's already an augmented reality device. And you're talking about designing from 2D into 3D. And then of course, when it comes to VR, of course, like we're talking about devices and, you know, and glasses and so on, but like that, I think is the next, the next frontier when it comes to um, technology. If like, if someone wants to get into design right now, I think anything, doing anything on mobile, fantastic, great, like relevant and doing anything on web and doing anything like, you know, surface design. There's so many things that people could get into when it comes to user experience and interaction design. But I think that one of the things that seems the most exciting to me right now, and it's happening right now, this is not like, it's, it's already happening. You can get an Oculus Quest and have an incredible experience, or you can, there's people over at Facebook, like collaborating at work through VR so, and, and with avatars and stuff like that. So I think that that is, that is one thing that 
if you know if someone wanted to future proof what's happened in the, in the, in the next five ten years and i'm not talking about just facebook i mean obviously all the companies are probably thinking about this space in different ways but we just don't know it yet <laughs> so or we're not entirely sure so i think that's uh, that's one one to pay close attention to because it's going to be a lot more relevant a lot sooner than i think most people think well the pace of acceleration is getting faster and faster isn't it and that and that's what happens with technology every single day like more is possible in less time and that's exponential it's very exciting. Thanks for sharing your experience. My guest has been Diego Polito. He's a senior interaction designer right now at Google, but his experience is deep. And I'm sure you got a bright future ahead too. Hey, as a footnote to our conversation, Diego, I had to ask, on your Twitter description, you say that you're <laughs> the creator and inventor of the Diego Chino. And I have to know the design recipe and concept behind this fantastic drink it is it, it's a secret if i if i told you that would that would just that would just ruin the whole secret no a diego chino a diego chino <laughs> is nothing but an actual cappuccino that it just happens to be made by me and that's how special it is and that's how special it should be and that's it <laughs> and can't we all learn from that to put our fingerprint on whatever we're doing it could be uniquely ours, right? I'm a, I'm a firm believer that when you cook something or you make a drink, it doesn't matter how easy it is, that you're putting a little bit of your energy, you're putting a little bit of your love in it. So big or small, like, and that's why sometimes like home cooked meals taste better because I can sense that dedication and love that has been put into it. So Diego Chino is just a, a smaller somatomic version of that. It just happens to have a little bit in, in it. And if it's just the intention that I, made you a, a cappuccino on my mostly automatic machine and just kind of put it together, then that's what a Diego Chino is. I love that. And I love the passion and energy, uh, even behind a simple cappuccino. <laughs> Diego, I wanted to be sure people knew how to find you, connect with you and follow your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you want to learn more about anything involving who I am, my website, it's painfully easy to type in. It's diego.soy, S-O-Y, like soy milk. Uh, it's actually a play on words because soy means I am in Spanish. So it's just basically I am Diego. So Diego.soy and just about anything else that involves social media, IXDiego at IXDiego. At IXD is short for interaction design. It's a bit of a play on words. I actually used to be at Diego on Instagram before my account got hacked and given to a Mexican celebrity. You can inquire on your own time about how that unfolded, but let's just say that it, it was a whole ordeal that went from a medium post to an interview on MTV, true crime about how that happened. It's a, it's a great read. <laughs> but, Listeners, you got to dig into it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's it definitely like just grab some popcorn and just like sit down and, and or watch the true life crime episode if, and, and I'm at the beginning of it. But, um, but yeah, anywhere else, I, Diego, at I, Diego, that's how you can get a hold of me. And if, of course, you know, anything that we've been talking about here with Mark or any questions, comments, concerns, happy, just reach out. Always happy to connect with more, with more people. Uh, that sounds great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for having me here. It's amazing. Uh, it's, been, it's been a fantastic conversation. Appreciate it a lot. And listeners, come back again for our next episode. We're going to continue our around the world journeys and talking with creative practitioners everywhere about how they come up with ideas and of course, how they organize those ideas and prepare them and gain the connections and confidence to launch them out into the world. So until next time, I'm Mark Stenson, and we've been unlocking your world of creativity. See you soon. Unlocking your world of creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. This program was produced by BSB Media, creators of IntelliKey Leadership Stories, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, and thepeaceroom.love. We've created a special offer just for listeners of the podcast. You can get the book, A World of Creativity, for a special price of $5.98 for paperback. And the Kindle version is only 99 cents. Go to mark-stinson.com to take advantage of this special offer. Our podcast is supported by Adobe and the Adobe Creative Cloud, the world's best creative app and services, so you can make almost anything you can imagine wherever you're inspired. We use Adobe to help make this podcast, using Audition, Premiere Rush, InDesign, and more. So join the creative community with the Adobe Creative Cloud and let's make something better unlocking your world of creativity.